been up to. So um, I think that most of you um, do know who Wild Oxfordshire are, but just as a quick reminder, we're all about bringing people together to do the best thing for nature on their patch. So as a charity, we don't own any land or nature reserves, but we inspire and advise people on the best thing they can do for nature's recovery on their patch. Whether they're a community group, a parish council, a farmer, a landowner, a business. And we also bring together all of the people working and volunteering in the conservation sector as well, so they can share knowledge and all work together to achieve nature recovery in Oxfordshire. We work with over 100 community groups and 80 organisations and engage with thousands of individuals every year. So how do we bring people together to help them deliver nature recovery? So we've got several different things that we do. We lead several partnerships um, uh, involving people working and volunteering in the conservation sector, but also farmers and communities, local authorities, DEFRA bodies, landowners and businesses. And we do this at several different scales <clears throat> from the local community level and um, parish and town level up to landscape scale partnerships like around river catchments and also strategic partnerships across Oxfordshire. And we provide uh, practical um, site based ecological advice to people and also advice about um, how best to work together. And we also have really carefully curated information on our website and the monthly email bulletin that I mentioned earlier and our biannual newsletters. And then we also do training courses, and workshops and events online and in person to bring people together to share their knowledge um, between, between themselves. So <clears throat> what we need uh, if we all want to work together to achieve nature recovery is that we need to have a county wide strategy so that we've got a framework that we can all work towards and contribute to in whatever way we can. So in 2017, we worked with our partners to produce the state of nature, which sets out what we need, um, what we need to do in Oxfordshire to achieve nature recovery. And this um, highlighted that we need to create more, bigger, better and joined up areas for nature. So um, more recently, we again worked with our partners, Thames Valley Environmental Record Centre, um, to create a draft um, nature recovery network map, which shows spatially where we need to um, do this work for nature recovery. The next step after this will be the Oxfordshire local nature recovery strategy. Um, and we've been working with, um, again, with TVERC and VBOUT and the local nature partnership um, and Oxfordshire County Council to do some preparatory work on the local nature recovery strategy. We need to make sure that the strategy is evidence-based and um, is properly co-designed by stakeholders and is resourced to deliver the action on the ground. So we need to make sure that a strategy is not just the usual suspects coming together from the conservation sector and the deaf bodies, but we really need everyone involved. So we've been working on um, bringing in more farmers and landowners and more businesses into our networks of people and organisations who want to help achieve nature recovery. And we're also going to be working with the local nature partnership on creating a natural capital investment plan so that we actually have the funding required to deliver nature recovery on the ground to take that action. We don't just want another strategy that sits on the shelf, we want it to actually deliver nature recovery. Um, so we've been helping to set up the Oxfordshire Nature Partnership and that is now set up and I got a seat on the board and we run one of the subgroups, the Biodiversity Advisory Group, and we also work with lots of the other subgroups as well. Um, so I'm really looking forward, um, you know, this year to, to being able to achieve even more with the Local Nature Partnership and also with our sort of um, new friends in the farming and business sectors as well as continuing our work with brilliant people working and volunteering in the conservation sector and also the health sector as well. So I think it's a really exciting time to be working in nature conservation because there are so many opportunities and so many people keen to help. Um, and we're really working really hard to, um, to really harness that enthusiasm and pull it all in the, in the right direction so we can achieve nature recovery. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the ways um, that we 
all need to work is at the um, landscape scale. And one type of landscape scale partnership is a catchment partnership. And there are several of these in Oxfordshire. And the one that we host is the Evenload Catchment Partnership. So these are all about bringing um, people together to get the water environment around a river in good ecological status. Because at the moment, I think it's not a secret at all. The rivers are in a really poor state and there's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of sewage being released into the rivers um, and, uh, and that the water quality is pretty terrible. Um, but we've got some excellent partners in the Evenload Catchment Partnership. And during last year, more than 30 organisations came together to create and begin to implement the Smarter Water Catchment Plan, which is the plan to improve the river even load. We've been working with the Northeast Cotswolds Farmer Cluster, which is a group of farmers who want to farm with nature in mind and helping, um, helping them. And also um, the Even Node Catchment Partnership has been working with landowners and farmers to create wetlands and restore river floodplain uh, connections. And they've launched a wetland creation grant scheme for funding um, for farmers and details of that are on our website. Um, the Evenode has also been um, working with uh, 12 schools and 1,200 children and had lots of uh, attended several community outreach days as well to increase um, support um, and understanding of what we need to do around the river. We've now got live water quality monitoring data on the website so people can see the results of the citizens, citizen science monitoring around the water quality. Um, it's not good news. <laughs> But um, at least if people know what's happening, then there's more of a chance they'll be able to do something about it. And um, the Evenode Catchment Partnership has also been doing some natural flood management around Morton in the Marsh and Bleddington um, and monitoring um, the water levels to better understand what's going on and to provide an early warning system for residents who uh, have been being regularly flooded. Another um, partnership that we host is the Yellow Wagtail Partnership. Um, this is all about restoring and managing a four mile stretch of land across the River Thames. Um, and we obviously want to increase the biodiversity of this area, but also want to ensure that the farmers are um, able to farm in an economically sustainable way. So we're hoping that this will be um, an exemplar um, for other farmers who are doing who are um, farming along floodplain meadows. Um, in October 2021, our project officer Sophie started her PhD on yellow wagtail ecology, which she's doing at the same time as working on this project for us. Um, and last year they continued to um, collect invertebrate data to understand how changes in management can affect ground nesting birds such as and farmland birds like the yellow wagtail. There's also been, Sophie's been doing a lot of engagement with farmers and landowners and communities um, through attending um, events, including the Oxford Real Farming Conference and also giving talks to groups such as Sustainable Harwell. So we're really looking forward um, in 2023 to this project developing further and seeing um, how we can use um, science and research to make a positive impact on management um, of the land and a, and a positive impact on nature. Like I said, whilst also ensuring that farmers can produce food, that is very important. Uh, another project um, that we run is around curlews. So these are sort of ground nesting birds that are really um, in dire straits from a conservation point of view, and they really need um, a very, some very focused attention on them. So this project is all about identifying um, curly nests and then working with the farmers on the land they've been found and with volunteers to, um, to, uh, to fence the, the nests so that they're protected um, from predators until the birds have fledged. So um, over 2021 and 22, um, more than 50 nests were located and protected across the whole project area. And um, along the River Thames, seven were protected by fences and um, we saw at least six curlews fledged. So that was actually great. Uh, three of the chicks were fitted with tags and one of those um, has actually been spotted 
on the mudflats of the Severn Estuary in August um, last year. So that was really great news that they'd um, grown up and left home and were uh, enjoying life <laughs> in the Severn Estuary. So um, again, we're looking to um, continue this project um, into 2023 and beyond um, and learn even more about the other reasons why um, curlews might not be breeding successfully and, and what actions needed for that. Um, <clears throat> another really important area that Wild Oxfordshire um, leads on in the county and in fact probably the country as well is in really working with um, communities so that they can uh, deliver nature recovery on their patch so we provide support to community groups, parish councils um, and town councils so that they can um, have a positive impact in their local area. Um, in 21 and 22, we had a Hedgerow Heroes project supported by CPRE, and that resulted in the planting and rejuvenation of more than two kilometres of hedgerow. And as well as that, a really good increased understanding of hedgerow management um, for a range of audiences. We had a hedgerow themed local environment, local environment groups conference, which reached uh, about 500 people. Um, and we've also got um, uh, some really good um, information on our website as well. Um, we, um, yeah, and we also had an environment groups conference in, um, in 2022, and that was an in-person one um, because we could do it in person. And um, that was all about what you can do for nature and why wildlife matter. And we've also been working with um, owners of small land holdings as well, who would like to improve their land for nature recovery. Um, there are now almost 100 community groups working across Oxfordshire to bring the wild back into their neighbourhood, which is um, a big increase over the last few years. Um, we've got a map of these on our website, so um, do check that out to find the group nearest to you and join in if you'd like to. Or if you don't have one in your area, you can start one. Um, and we've got lots of well-researched guidance on our website. We've been working really hard um, last year to uh, create a new website which will make our resources easier to find and also a video explaining um, all about what Wild Oxfordshire does so the new website and the video are going to be launched very very soon um, and the other really exciting thing is that we've been successful in raising funding from a combination of local authorities public donations by the big give at Christmas individuals and family trusts um, and that means that we're currently out to advert for one full-time or two part-time community ecologists to join our team. So we're really excited to be able to expand our team in 2023 and meet the increased demands from um, community groups and parish councils. And for me, it's so um, brilliant to show just how many more people want to join in with achieving nature recovery in Oxfordshire. Um, so that's really great news for me. Um, and this year we'll be continuing to focus on hedges because they are so brilliant for nature. We're also adding in edges, um, not just because it rhymes, um, so, but also because they're another very valuable um, habitat for wildlife. So road verges and the edges um, alongside hedges, the grassland edges are also important. So we've been doing some um, surveys and helping parishes with some road verges. Um, and there'll also be lots more information about these on our website, we'll be continuing our um, information sharing into 2023. Um, that's all from me for now. Um, just a reminder that if anyone isn't already, um, sign up to our monthly email bulletin. And of course, we're on all the socials. Um, so, so yes, join, our, join us in achieving nature recovery in Oxford year, and that would be lovely. Um, OK. So next, I'm going to hand over to John T. Brunier, who's Head of Sustainable Farming at FarmEd in West Oxfordshire. John T. is passionate about regenerative farming and sustainable food and knowledge exchange, and he's got 25 years experience in the sustainable farming sector. So this is um, sure to be a really um, insightful and interesting talk. Um, we have lots of time for questions as well, because... Um, it's really nice to have questions in the discussion. If you have any questions as John T is giving his presentation, if you could please um, type those into the chat 
then that would be great. And then after John T's done his presentation, Mike will ask people who've um, written a question in the chat to sort of turn their video on and ask John T in person their question. But if we can just put it in the chat to begin with, then we'll know um, how many people have got questions and what the questions are. And that would really help us out. Okay, so I'm gonna now um, stop sharing and um, that has worked good and I can see John T everything seems to be going well <laughs> Hi, Camilla. hello everybody thank you thank you Camilla for inviting me today um, I know some names and well I'm going to say faces I know some fa names on the board today so it's lovely to meet you all again some of you have been to farm ed uh, and some of you will be new new I guess to the messages and my talk today which is great I'm going to share my screen now, and that should hopefully work. There we go. Miller shout if that isn't working. That looks like that's working for me. Brilliant. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so, yeah. Can regenerative farming save the world? I think I chose a too big a title, Camilla. <laughs> but I'm going to attempt to answer it. I will come back to the big question at the end. What I'm most passionate about is how can we nourish people and regenerate the planet? That's probably the focus of my talk. But really, it's going to be an overview of a little bit about farm ed, some of the issues that we're trying to tackle, um, but also what is regenerative agriculture, regenerative farming, where does it fit with agroecology and some other movements? And what does it actually mean on the ground? Is how, and how does that fit with nature recovery? Got lots of slides, bear with me, it's going to be a real journey. I'm going to go quite quick through some of these themes. I can't cover it all today, so I would like to see you at FarmEd at some point. Um, so as Camilla said, I'm John T. John T. Brunye. Um, I'm Head of Sustainable Farming and Food Systems, and that word food systems is crucial. We can ta talk farming and ecology and landscape all day, but unless we change a food system, we're not going to get much gain. Um, so I will occasionally touch on the word system as I go. I'm also a practitioner. Um, I started life, I'm a farmer's son from Nottinghamshire, an arable farmer's son, um, went to agricultural college. My first proper job was with FWAG, Farming and Wildlife Advisory Group, uh, back in the early 90s. Um, I ended up as deputy head of the National Trust for Agriculture, um, covering Northern England, Northern Ireland. Did lots of work with farm tenants, whole farm planning, stewardship schemes, air, soil, water, the start of sustainability and farming, I guess. Uh, consultancy, and um, I ended up teaching before I came to farm ed at the Royal Agricultural University, teaching farm business management alongside sustainability and food chains and tourism and, and sustainable agriculture modules, all sorts of crazy things, wonderful. I got my own farm tenancy about 17, 18 years ago. So I farmed down on the National Trust Estate at Sherborne Park near North Leach, um, 180 acres. And I call myself a regenerative agroecological pasture fed organic holistic farmer. It is possible to do all of those things. And I'll touch on all those points as I go through my talk. But I do try and practice what I preach with beef, lamb, wildflower meadows, wild bird covers, lots of hedges and edges, as Camilla said, um, market garden, farm shop, wedding business. So I do try and practice what I preach and try and link things together, which I think is important. Um, if you've not been to Farm Ed, or if you want a quick refresher, we are the Centre for Farm and Food Education, based um, just outside Shipton under Witchwood. And we're about 107 acres. Um, and we um, aim really to try and be at the heart of local, regional and global agroecological transition. Most of our impact is local, maybe about 80%. I think a lot of our audience impacts, maybe about 10, 15% is regional um, and about 5% is global. We do have a global outreach program and some really good work um, across the globe. We are a not-for-profit, a community interest company, so we're always looking for help. So if anybody of you know of any great funders or projects we can get involved in, we do need your help, so please bear that in mind. But what do we actually do? Um, we're effectively a demonstration farm. There's lots going off on the farm for you to come and see, get your hands dirty. But we're here, I guess, to provide learning space. That's physical and mental space and events 
that try and do three things, inspire, educate and connect. Hopefully to inspire people, you know, light bulb moments. What can you do at local level? What can you do within your business or on your farm? Educate, which is a word I'm not a big fan of. I prefer knowledge exchange or knowledge share. Um, everything from practical tips to policy to programs to deep thinking. There's all sorts of stuff that we do on the education knowledge exchange front. And connection. We try and connect people to each other and connect people back to nature and the soil, which I think is really important. And ultimately to build a sustainable farming and food system, that word again, that nourish people. And nourishment, of course, is yield times nutrient density times access to food. And that's complex. With the ultimate goal of regenerating the planet. We've got big, a big aim. It's no good just regenerating a field or a farm or even a landscape, we've got to think big. But we start locally, but let's keep going upwards. Regeneration is key to us. And um, there's a quick just pictorial of the farm, uh, very diverse. We've got herbal lays in rotation, uh, four years of herbal lay. Then we go into things like conventional wheat um, and heritage wheats. We've got barley, we've got oats, we've got undersown crops, living mulches and under trial. Got Sanfoin, we've got Lucerne, um, we've got a five acre market garden, a CSA, a community supported agriculture scheme, the kitchen garden people feeding around 130 families a week. Permanent pasture, wildflower meadows in the middle there, natural flood management scheme, um, which is helping to protect the even load. Additional heritage orchard, we've got beehives, we've got mob graze cattle, mob graze sheep, and I'm sure I've forgotten some other things in there too. So lots going off, lots of tree planting too hedges, optimum shelter belts, and you know, thicker woodland. Dry stone walling also being done as well, restoring the walls, public access. We get lots of people to farm ed for all sorts of reasons. We do demonstrations, we do farm walks, we do film nights, food nights. We do skills workshops, deeper dive workshops. Currently just running a 12 day course on holistic management, for example. Uh, venue hire, conferences, all sorts, anything to get people talking about agroecology, nature, food, sustainable farming, try and bring them together. We also work off farm a little bit. It's not all just based at FarmEd. We do do some mentoring, consultancy, some bigger project work across the UK and things like this, webinars, etc., which have a you know, wider audience. People often say, what do you cover at FarmEd? What do you talk about? It's everything, everything from soil health, to human gut health and brain health and everything in between. It's very diverse. The audience is key. It's not just farmers. It's not just landowners. We have to speak to everybody. And I beg you out there to do the same. We have to speak to our local communities, the schools, the kids, the families, the buyers of food, the researchers, the universities, Yes, then the farmers, the growers, let's not forget growers here, agronomists, foresters, tomorrow's young farmers and land managers, career changers, entrepreneurs, pension companies, investment banks, and of course the NGOs, the policymakers, etc. And we need to join all the dots. It's a really diverse audience, it's a hard one for our marketing team, but we have to join the dots through the food chain. That has impact. So do come and you know, do join us whenever you can. We've got lots of different courses. Do check out our website, sign up to our newsletter, sign up to all our social media feeds if you can. Lots of exciting things going off. Um, I'm just thinking what's happening right now. We've got an internship. We're just recruiting someone for an internship at the moment. We're running leadership courses on sustainability. Lots of stuff on soil health, which of course relate to regenerative agriculture so well. All sorts of things happening. So the main body of my talk, how are we going to regenerate the planet? How are we going to save society? How are we going to feed people? It's a massive challenge. And obviously, you know, lots of the problems out there. But very quickly, um, we've got a problem. Population times consumption times speed of change, the great acceleration. I cannot think of a single positive metric at global level. No, actually, I'm wrong. I can think of one. The ozone layer has started to close. 
There were a few issues with it, but we are turning that one round. Everything else is negative. Soil health, pollinators, farmland bird numbers, ozone, uh, not ozone, um, CO2 levels, climate change, forestry, uh, forest cover, etc. all negative. That's at global level. At local level, of course, we have some positives, but we must think globally. But at local level, yes, we're seeing some increases in farmland bird numbers. We are seeing some habitat improvements. We are seeing some soil enhancements, but it's not great. So we have a problem, The Great Acceleration, a good book if you've not read it. And now I speak to you as a farmer, a practical farmer. How do I, as a farmer, do something about that challenge at the same time as producing food, at the same time as producing all the other public goods, that society, what we want, provided by our countryside. You know, we want biodiversity, we want flood, flood zones, we want heritage, we want public access and recreation. We want landscape, we want genetic preservation and history and heritage. It's complex, you know all those public goods. Multifunctional land use. At the same time, I'm faced as a farmer with it's too wet, it's cold, too dry, it's too windy doesn't rain, it's you know, permafrost you know, since about December here on the farm at home. It's climate change is happening, we're facing it every season. It's challenging and it's, it's getting worse. We're really facing it now every, every season. And at the same time, of course, as a farmer, as a food producer, we're faced with um, food policy change and consumer change and pressure. Most of us are overweight, we're eating the wrong thing, we're, we're killing ourselves by what we eat and buy and what's marketed in the supermarkets and the marketing. And of course, as a society, we waste about a third of our food. What can I do about that as a farmer, as a foodie, as a father? It's complex. Also, of course, absolutely the pressure to move towards net zero and we can't spend too long on this today, but we have to move towards net zero. The pressure's there, top down and bottom down. It's all about carbon cycles and methane cycles. I put it out there right now, no time to go into it, but maybe methane is a distraction from cattle anyway, cyclical methane. But there, are, there is hope. And I think as an industry, as a farmer, we can go beyond net zero. We can cut our emissions, we can cut our input, inputs, we can sequester an awful lot of carbon on our farm. I think we can go beyond and we might have a little bit left to sell and to sequester for others, but not a lot. We have to keep it on farm for our supply chains first and then our communities and then maybe for the airlines, for Google, etc. But there isn't a lot spare but it is being pushed down the chain. The risk is being pushed down the chain to farmers. We can do some great work and that's where Regen comes in. We also have a problem with the food that we eat, declining nutrient density. Lots of research out there showing how zinc, manganese, iron, etc., the levels are falling in the food that we grow and the food that we consume. We've got problems. Now, most of that, some of that is to do with soil quality and the how we grow stuff, but a lot of it is to do with the seed that we use and how fast we grow things and what we select for. We select for fast growing genotypes, etc., that um, resist disease and maybe respond to nitrogen, but maybe they don't taste, smell or have great um, nutrient density. That is a problem that we have to do something about, but there are opportunities there too, which is exciting. And of course, can't have a talk like this without talking about input inflation. It's affecting us all at all levels, of course, but fertilizer, labor, rent, electricity, it's a killer on farm. I don't know how we're going to produce lots of wonderful nutrient dense food and nature and all the other public goods that we want and somehow survive as an industry. It's getting harder and harder. Just to share some very quick figures with you. Uh, these are figures from DEFRA and um, England uh, figures, English farming. Um, there are four cost centres in agriculture. There's basically the, the, the profit or the income minus expenditure that we get from selling food. And on the graph in front of you, that's the dark blue box at the bottom of those uh, columns. Then there's the money from agri-environment payments, you know, HLS, ELS, stewardship, etc., and hopefully a bit of ELMS and SFI in the future. 
That's the grayish box, the light gray. The lighter blue is diversification, the money that comes in from our livery, from our farm shops, from our holiday cottages, the wedding barns, the solar panels on our roofs. The, dark, the light gray at the top or the medium gray is from basic payment scheme, the old common agricultural policy payments, the subsidy. I don't think I have to say too much about those columns. I think you can see what's happening. Just about, we're just about making a living or a profit from the food production bit, the agriculture box. It's just above the line for most farms, not all. There's a little bit there, a little bit of profit in agri-environment payments and the stewardship payments. We're very reliant on diversification, profits and income, the blue box, but totally reliant on BPS, the basic payment subsidy that was from Brussels, but now from the UK government. And of course, it's that grey box, the subsidy that is declining, being um, taken away right now with that money, hopefully going into the agri-environment box, into the ELMS box, which is fine. We'll come on to that later. But you can just see how crucial it is to us. And if I just click to that slide, look at the, low, the grazing livestock figures below the line. About half of us, three quarters of us, of us, lose money on every sheep and beef animal we keep on farm. We are surviving from the subsidy, the agri-environment scheme payments, and um, the diversification money. Those figures are slightly out of date now, um, obviously with Ukraine, Russia, inflation, etc., cetera, you know, massive vo uh, volatility, um, but the trends continue. It is very hard to survive to produce great food and environment under current environment, under current conditions. About half of us could be bankrupt in the next three or four years as the BPS payments are withdrawn. We need something very quickly to replace it that works. It's overwhelming. I don't know how you feel, but I'm overwhelmed as an educator, as a consultant, as a mentor, as a farmer, as a father, as a member of a rural community. As a conservationist, as an environmentalist, I'm overwhelmed, and I'm sure many of you are too. I've never known it so challenging, so complex, and sometimes so, I'm going to say the word hopeless, but I don't mean I'm totally hopeless. I think um, sometimes I lose hope, and more and more people I speak to are losing that. But there's also lots of positives too, which I will come on to. So what might the future of farming and food look like? Well, it is going to look a lot like this. We are going to have more processed uh, proteins, whether it's cellular or fermented. Um, I don't think George Monbiot is on the call today, but I know George pretty well. Um, he's got a point. I totally get what he's on about with cellular, uh, with fermented proteins. I think it's worth looking at. It's not the future I want, and I don't think it's the, um, the answer, but we're not going to stop it. There will be more of this. Um, where does the money, where does the shareholder value go, et cetera? It's, another, it's a question for another day. But we will have different foods, different supply chains trying to solve uh, the big problems. We'll also look more like this. This is efficiency. This is sustainable intensification. If you want efficient agriculture, this is what we do. On the left, there's a the big pig hotel in China. Um, you know, I think it's something like 200,000 pigs in a building monitored, fed a very good diet, um, don't move around too much, abattoir underneath the market down the road, incredibly efficient. If we want an efficient food and farming system, this is what we do. On the right, floating dairy farm in Holland, again, incredibly efficient. There's monitors, the sensors, the cows, you know, very high welfare in one way, fed a very good diet, the slurries collected underneath, very little impact on the environment, the market is just next door. If we want an efficient food system, we keep doing this. But again, I don't think it's what I want. and I don't think it's what my community wants. And I don't think it's probably what most of you want either. So let's find some answers. Personally, I think agroecology is the answer. Agroecology is the shelf on the library where we need to be. Agroecology basically covers all the ecological and social concepts and principles around food and farming systems that we need. It's complex, it's deep, it reflects global north and global south issues. It involves people and that's key for me. So if you've not read much about agroecology, I do beg you to look at it. There's lots of different ways of looking at agroecology as a theme. 
I quite like the FAO's 10 elements of agroecology. And it's all around diversity, co-creation of knowledge, synergy, which is crucial, efficiency. Yes, we do need efficiency in the system. Of course we do, but it's not the only measure. It's about recycling. It's about resilience, human and social values. We need a farming and food system that respects people and culture and tradition. Absolutely crucial. We need good governance in farming and food. I think we need it to be circular and we need solidarity within that too. That kind of sums up agroecology in one minute. A subset of agroecology is regenerative agriculture. And I think regen is part of the solution. Regenerative farming, um, it's nothing new. I'll come on to where it come from, um, sort of stemmed from in a moment, but I'm sure many of you read Dirt to Soil over lockdown. It was a lot of farmers and land managers sort of uh, go-to books. If you haven't, do look at Dirt to Soil from Gabe Brown. It's um, one of the best introductory te texts to regen the issues, you know, the solutions, and a one farming family's story. But that theme of regeneration, for me, is really deep and impactful. Um, I grew up on a family farm. It was degenerative. It was depletive. It was about removing habitat, moving away from ecosystem services. It was input heavy to grow lots of wheat, barley, oilseed, rape. I get it. We need to feed people. To the 80s, 90s, we moved into green policies and programs, the sustainable farming programs. Not enough. We need much more. Slowly but surely, we're moving to a, a restorative, a regenerative system, a regenerative thinking that spans more than agriculture. I'm a big fan of regenerative tourism, regenerative leadership, regenerative nutrition, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Everything we do should be regenerative, slowly but surely. Okay. And it's all regenerative in a, in a nutshell. If I had to sum it up in three words, it's about improving, enhancing, rebuilding. If whatever we're doing on our land or in society isn't doing one of those three things, then we need to stop it. But we need to improve, rebuild, enhance, improve biodiversity, enhance our soils, reconnect with our communities and food systems. Those positive words, that's regenerative thinking for me. Regenerative agriculture is about going beyond conservation and sustainability. Came out of systems of desperation. Have a look at people like Alan Savory, Darren Doherty, Gabe Brown. It was about farming systems that were on its knees and had to do something different. Farming without inputs, without money, and building back from the bottom using ecosystem services and nature-based solutions. It's about increasing biodiversity, building those, those soils, improving water catchments and enhancing nutrient cycling, which is key. And if you get it right, you lock in carbon above ground and below ground. And if you get it right and do enough of it, we should be able to slow down and maybe reverse the accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. And if you get it really right, you get better yields, not less, better animal welfare, lower input costs, absolutely, more resilient farm businesses, healthier and happier farmers and farming and rural communities too, if you go deep enough. So it's exciting. At FarmEd, we talk about regenerative landscapes, you know, more community regeneration too, and that rural, um, that food system piece, trying to link it all together. It sits in agroecology for me. It draws from a lot of the themes of agroecology. It links to organics. It links to holistic management. There isn't a set definition. There isn't a set set of standards for regenerative agriculture yet. There's lots coming. I hope it doesn't spoil the movement and the passion. I think we do need a set of standards, but at the moment, everyone's working through it through the sets of principles, working the things that work on their land that improve, enhance, rebuild. It is also a movement. There are six principles of regenerative agriculture, which I'll quickly go into. Um, the one that probably most people know about is minimise soil disturbance. To be regenerative, we need to try and leave that topsoil alone. Stop ploughing wherever we can. Stop put it using glyphosate and sprays wherever we can. That's a type of soil disturbance. 
It's about letting that soil thrive, letting the mycorrhiza and the soil food web do its thing. Works for agriculture and it works for horticulture too, so zero dig horticulture. Now there's only two ways really of producing a seed bed. It's ploughing or spraying with Roundup, maybe drilling into it. Take your pick, which one you prefer. Everyone you know, has got a different opinion on this. I'm going to sit on in the middle today. At Farmed, we still plough, but we only plough two or three years in eight in the arable rotation. So it's a form of minimum tillage. And we use a very shallow plough. Again, trying to let that, let that topsoil do its thing. It's also about more perennial cropping, trying to move away from an annual diet of wheat, barleys, oilseed, grapes, grains, rices, maize, corn, whatever, trying to move more to a perennial cropping system. That's key. Principle two is about diversity. Trying to move to a polyculture away from monoculture. So instead of just growing ryegrass with a bit of clover in maybe, let's grow things like herbal lays with 16, 17, 20 different grasses, herbs, uh, legumes in there doing different things. Instead of just growing wheat, why don't we grow wheat with clover underneath or another companion crop? Or you'll see great with buckwheat underneath, so companion cropping all the time. Darwin showed that more diversity in a, in a crop, in an ecosystem, equals more yield. Collecting that sunlight in different ways, rooting depths, doing different things and more resilience. It's not always about less yield. It is about complexity, though. It's not just about the diversity of the crop that you grow. It's about the diversity of the rotation that you plan. So instead of wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, maybe peas back to the wheat, grass, 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 herbal lay, wheat, barley, oilseed, rape, beans, peas, peas, fallow, maybe back to herbal lay. Longer, more diverse rotations all the time. So diversity, diversity, diversity. Uh, principle three, keep the soil covered. Again, a crucial one, particularly in you know, places like the Evenload Valley. Let's keep that brown earth on oh, that topsoil on the hill, away from the water where it belongs, with all its nutrients that go with it. And one way of doing that, a crucial thing, is when you harvest in August, September, get that cover crop into the ground as quickly as possible, lock onto the soil, lock onto those nutrients, stop it washing downhill or blowing away if you're in a different part of the country, maybe on a different, a lighter soil. So that's where cover crops uh, really come into their own. Grow a crop through the winter, which can be grazed, of course, or you could mulch it back into the soil, feeding those roots. You'll see a lot more farmers doing that now. Livestock, a trickier one for some, and I get that. Um, but basically the sun shines, green stuff grows, it rains. What are we going to do with it? Well, as the previous slide, we could mush it and mash it back into the soil, feed the soil. Wonderful. Some fertility building there. Or we could use ruminant animals, particularly cattle, occasionally sheep, um, to graze that green stuff, turn it into protein for us and put the nutrients back onto the soil. And lots of other benefits too, particularly in your conservation grazing situations. So they're cycling those nutrients, they're moving them around the farm for us. Um, they're, they're stimulating things like methanotrophs and the soil bacteria. You can feed those animals, mob grazing with bales, etc. Sorry, mob grazing, moving them rapidly through the landscape, or bale grazing, feeding hay, silage out into the field, getting more nutrients back into that soil, keeping a healthy living soil. You can be regenerative without livestock, but my view is it is better with, for all sorts of reasons. Principle five, seek living roots all year. You know, the climate's changing, it's warmer usually, and my roots are trying to function all year. Um, and if you've got you know, tall grass and lots of stuff above ground, it's probably likely your roots are trying to function even in January, February, March. So it's about protecting those roots, feeding those roots, not overgrazing, using things like biostimulants, compost, compost teas, mulches, etc., to really feed that rooting system. That's key. Respect the root. Principle six is one that not many people talk about, uh, but I think it's crucial. Um, it's not an agronomy principle, it's more of a holistic management principle. And that's all around context and value. Every farm is different. So what do you want for your farm, your land, your soil, your community, your valley? 
Don't just follow the agronomy principles I've just laid out. Make it work for your objectives and your priorities. It's a really important principle. Just put a human face on those agronomy principles. So what? So if you do those principles, what will it look like? Well, if you get it right, you get a healthier and more resilient soil full of life um, with the nutrients starting to function and be released. You've got better structure, which is better for the roots and the plant, locking onto more water and more carbon. And, and that's crucial. We often focus on carbon, which I totally understand. And just to give you a flavor of the potential of Regen Ag, if we increase our soil organic matter by just 0.1 of a percent, so let's say 4.2 to 4.3% organic matter, which is pretty easy to do. They're pretty lowish figures for around where we are today in the Cotswolds. You'd lock in about nine tons of CO2 per year which is wor really worth doing. And we can keep going. We could get our soils, I mean, my soils here at my farm today and at um, Farm Ed, around six, 7% um, soil organic matter. So there's, yeah, th th there's lots of space. We could get it to nine, maybe 10. So that's a lot of CO2 sequestered. But also then people get a bit hung up and say, okay, when we've reached our maximum for our soil, maybe 9% organic matter, is that the limit? Are we, are we then stuck? He said, no, because we can keep building depth. If you really look after your soil, you can add another millimetre, five millimetres. Maybe I've seen some soils at that's one centimetre a year in, in growth of depth. That's all CO2 and carbon, if you get it right. Um, and it's not just about carbon. If you go into regen and do it well, particularly if you're doing things like diverse swords, tall grass grazing, it slows the airflow down. So particularly thinking back to the drought last summer, less scorched earth, less evaporation, cooler soils, roots are still functioning, as well, of course, habitat value too. Ultimately, that should lead to a healthier crop, whether it's wheat, barley, grass, what have you, uh, that needs less nitrogen fertilizer, so a climate and a nature positive um, impact already, and a healthier plant that should be more nutrient dense um, too. So it's got knock-ons, of course, for the food chain. And if you get that diversity in your system and you do it well, you have to feed your animals less. So less soya being imported, less grains being grown for those animals. It's all there in the soil. Those minerals are mostly there. They're just locked up. They need releasing. But feeding that diverse diet, they're healthier. Natural worm control, and natural anthelmintics, chicory, sanfoin, bird's foot trefoil in our herbal lays means we have to use less or no vet meds, particularly the wormers. I hardly use any vet meds now in my system and very rarely do I need antibiotics. The animals are so much healthier on a diverse diet. It's not rocket science, is it? Talked about overyielding effect. Yeah, if you've got lots of diversity, crops working together, you can increase yields. Um, if you were at Oxford Real Farming Conference in our herbal lay session um, a few weeks ago, we had some up-to-date data on how the wheat that followed a herbal lay rotation, the yields were higher than a conventional system with fertilizer in it. That was hot off the press from NIAB trials. So it's not always about lower yields. We can increase output too. Um, hopefully better profit and happier farmers. Let's not forget happiness and fun in this. Um, if you, and if you're cutting input costs and still grow, getting good yields, then that should lead to better profit, which we do need if we're going to be sustainable. Nutrient density, again, if you've got better soils, better functioning plants, if you're growing different crops in rotation, different seed varieties, maybe moving towards a bit more horticulture and perennial cropping, um, you'll get more nutrient density. The graph on the left, all about omega-3s and a ratio with omega-6s. If you've got those cattle, those sheep grazing diverse swords with legumes, you have things like clover in there, you get a better omega-3 ratio. Really important fatty acid. Of course, none of this is new. This is what granddad used to do. You know, the farming ladder George Henderson set in the valley. You know, the three... Um, Corn, bean, squash, the three sisters approach, multiple, multi-cropping, harvesting sunlight, crops working together, nothing new. Soil, grass and cancer, that's on our bookshelf at Farmed. It's 1968. 
kind of relate soil to the crops and the food that we grow in our own health. There's evidence there, it's crucial. Other things to consider, if we get this right, as farmers, we can start to stack some income, whether that's biodiversity net gain, whether it's carbon payments, you know, we need that, we, we need to survive, thinking back to that death for a slide on economics. So hopefully we can do more for the environment and hopefully be paid for those public goods to build resilient farm businesses. Something I'm particularly keen on is enterprise stacking. So instead of just having wheat, barley, oil, seed, rape, commodity monocrops, what if I did have wheat, barley, oil, seed, rape, peas, beans, herbal lay, herbal lay, herbal lay, beef, sheep, bees, you know, lots of pollinator zones on the habitat, market garden, uh, some education, agritourism, some maybe some pastured pigs, uh, low input poultry systems, what have you. So I've maybe gone from three enterprises that don't talk to each other to 10, 12, 15 farm enterprises that are now working in synergy. Low input, more resilient, more diverse, employing more people and producing more human food, which is crucial. And they're all feeding each other. So the wheat crop gives me some straw. The straw goes into the beef enterprise. The grass, of course, is doing its thing with nutrient cycling got diversity, which gives us the habitat and the pollinator zones for a bee enterprise. The manure and maybe, I don't know, agroforestry, got wood chip now going into a market garden, produce lots of wonderful local food. The waste from that is composted and might go back in to uh, the growing system or we might provide space for chickens and foraging on the insects, etc. So it's now all starting to link and work together. Big fan of enterprise stacking. It's a regen thing. And of course, it's not just the top six inches of soil and the first foot of growth. Farmers think upwards too. How do we get trees into our system? So I'm a big fan of agroforest agroforestry with that silver culture or silver arable, getting trees into our farming systems in lanes, in shelter belts, in sort of parkland situations. Scrub. I love scrub. I want more scrub in my farm. Absolutely. For all sorts of benefits, of course, from human food to access recreation, shade, shelter, carbon. I've already said, well, yeah, just to re-emphasize, low input approaches can be more profitable and I've done lots of research on this and it shows up time and time and again. If you can farm with nature, it normally cuts out a lot of the expensive inputs, you know, fertilizer, feed, uh, fossil fuel. So it can be a good way to build a sustainable business. A question I often get asked at FarmEd is, it's all right for you, John, T, at Conigree Farm or at Farm Ed. Um, you know, you're playing at farming with your hundred and odd acres. Can it be done at scale? Yes, it can. We've got lots of examples now across the UK. Lots of friends of mine doing it. Ed Horton, just down here near Sirencester. Um, Jake Freestone, a you know, wonderful pioneer of region egg, has been as for years and is doing it at scale. Lots of Tim May down in Hampshire, wonderful again, entrepreneurial, herbal lays, cattle, chickens, etc. through the system. So don't, listen, you don't have to listen to me with a few acres. And then, you know, go, to, go and look at those big farmers doing it well. Just a little, really to finish, really, I'm nearly there, a little bit about land sharing and land sparing. Um, I'm a land sharer. I believe we need lots of food from our landscape as well as habitat and public access and heritage, etc. And I, I'm always looking for those win-wins. How can I merge it all together, get maximum number of outputs and outcomes from every acre? I'm not a massive fan of putting fences around things and farming it purely for nature or rewilding. I think there's a middle ground, ag rewilding, whatever we want to call it, that we must you know, do a bit more work on. But it's complex, it's hard, particularly with funding. Funders just want instant impact, maybe it's lots of trees, put a fence around it, tick, outcome. Getting the complex outputs, outcomes from uh, land sharing is harder, but I think we need to put a little bit more effort there. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big, big fan of places like NEP, I know Charlie Burrell really well, and I'd love to see more space for nature through our landscapes linked together. Um, but let's think about more land sharing wherever we can. So just to finish, what do we need? What would I call for? 
Uh, more knowledge sharing, mentoring support. We need that. We need to build people's confidence, capacity, linkage, um, you know, just upskill everybody in these really complex ways of farming and managing land. We need more data and evidence. Um, Regen Ag is complex. There's not a lot of peer reviewed papers on it. There's lots of work on individual bits of Regen Ag, but it's hard and it, to, to sort of knit it all together. We need more of that. We also need labels that help consumers find agroecological regenerative grown produce so they can vote with their fork and with their food purchases. It's coming, but it's slow and it's hard. The global farm metric is one I'm a big fan of, and I hope that does grow um, you know, if you look at the Sustainable Food Trust for that, if you're interested. Um, we need shorter supply chains. We need to be able to sell this food locally, connect with our consumers, tell our stories. Some great examples locally, but we need more, more support for that. Um, there is a role. This isn't just dog and stick farming and what granddad used to do. There is a role for tech. Um, doesn't always sit well with me in agroecology and regen, but there is a role for robots, for big bits of tech and investment, particularly where it's about precision, less waste, sensors and data. So that is also exciting. And more or less finally, we also need policy. Policy that is joined up. We do not have it at all whatsoever. You know, the, the national food strategy has sort of fallen a bit flat. Elms, SFI, what a mess, what a nightmare. I'm quite, well, I'm supportive of the call for the land use framework. We do need a land use strategy for England that will help us and be a framework we can hang everything off. But I think the crucial message here on policy is let's not wait for policy, let's crack on. Farming transition, it's happening already and it's happening despite policy. Farmers are cracking on, doing it, doing great things out there already. And we need to embrace that and foster that. And finally, local action is key, of course. Thank you, Wild Oxfordshire. Things like ECP, wonderful. The North East Cotswold Farmer Cluster Group, which we helped set up at FarmEd, doing great work. It does start at local level. Just to finish, I probably mentioned all sorts of terminology. How do they all fit together? This is a little slide I produced that really shows where we need to be. Uh, bottom left, if we want efficient field scale agriculture, then precision ag is where we're at. Conservation ag go, and integrated farm management goes up the chain and we start to get farm and food system change. Brilliant. But what we need is a new far food system at global scale. And I think we'll only get there if it embraces agroecology, biodynamics, permaculture, organics, regen ag approaches at depth, because they are about redesign and food systems. That just helps frame all those terms that I'm sure you've come across. And I'll stop there. I'm about on time. I'll leave you with that slide and a few apps to follow if you wish. So I've raced through lots there, but I'll happily take questions for 15 minutes. Great. Thanks very much, John. T. It's Mike Pollard here. And uh, I'm going to uh, help if you like, manage the, the uh, questions. But we have got some great questions in the chat there. So thanks, everybody, as you've been thinking of those. We have got 15 minutes for questions. Is that OK, Camilla? And then. Yeah, that'd yeah. be great. Yes, yes. Um, I don't really have much to say at the end, so we can take as long as, um, as, long as the discussion takes us. Brilliant. OK. Um, so uh, we've got some really specific questions and some quite broad questions there. So we'll maybe take a couple of the specific ones to start with. And we've got one from Anthony Matthew. Anthony, would you like to share your question, please, with John T? Thank you, John T, very much indeed for your most informative and helpful talk. I really appreciated all that you've put into it. Um, I do have a question about the amount of possible methane that is given out by livestock, particularly cows, um, in regard to the different diets that they are feeding on. And I just wonder whether there is any information about, you know, low, uh, an all grass diet compared with a lot of inputs from cereal, soy or, or other feedstuffs. Thank you. Yeah, it, that's a complex one. But yes, there's lots of data out there. There's lots of research and peer reviewed papers um, out there and more coming out. Um, if you feed a cow a rough diet, 
a conservation grazed cow on very rough grass will burp an awful lot more than one fed on a mixed ration um, in the farmyard. Um, just like you and I, if we eat lots of roughage, we burp and fart a bit more. Um, but the beauty, of course, is if you're eating no input diet, so no fertilizer gone in, no fossil fuel gone into that diet, so conservation grazing or a pasture fed system, um, it's cyclical, that methane cycles, the methane cycle. Um, so for me, yes, the outputs on a um, conservation grazed cow is more um, if you measure just the methane, but the cyclical nature of it makes it the footprint smaller. I worry about high input diets with lots of fertilizer, lots of fossil fuel in it, which, you know, it, fossil fuel, I think methane is a bit of a distraction. It's the fossil fuel bit of that food, that animal diet that I worry about. There are diets now being developed, things like seaweed, which will help reduce the methane content um, of the burping. Okay. That, good, um, Anthony. Okay, thank you. We've got a, another one from Stephen. Stephen Lockwood, are you, would you like to ask your question? And just unmute yourself and I think it's still there. It's just saying. Well, I can ask the question on his behalf. Where do um, field scale root crops fit into a regenerative system? So that, mm. that's his question, John T. Um, it's a tricky one, isn't it? Because we do need to move to a more plant-based diet and therefore field scale root crops, we do need them, absolutely. Um, but they're not always great for soil. Um, there's a massive, so oh, that's my doorbell. <laughs> and the dog about to bark. Um, so my view is if you're looking after your, you need a long diverse rotation. You need those herbal lays, grasses, look after your soil, min till wherever you can. And hope that builds a really healthy, thriving soil to grow a good root crop. But you have to do it well. With cover crops, with modern technology, it can be done. Um, late harvesting, etc. of root crops is damaging with compaction etc so yeah, it's a tricky one and it's one that lots of people are trying to tackle right now we're growing potatoes regeneratively there are there is some good work coming out okay thanks thanks for that one it's yeah we're learning an awful lot i think uh, this morning so uh, keep keep going it's fantastic oh. stuff um lynn lynn parker lynn you've got a quite a practical interesting question as well would you like to ask yours oh, hi john t um, yeah, so I am new to farming, so we took on a share farm about 18 months ago um, in Shropshire, I think originally where you got your cows from, actually, ah. Hall. Um, so you may know the farm well, but our cows are fed grass purely, so it's silage and hay, um, as well as the, the grass and the um, and, you know, the, the grasses are, it's really, fur, it's really kind of varied, um, so their diet is pretty interesting and so we don't you know in terms of I'm kind of fine with the cows the cows that it kind of works for me um the sheep is a different matter so we the, the farm doesn't support the sheep the sheep can't um thrive they're not in good enough condition if we just feed them hay we have to buy and feed so we're thinking about how that works for us ethically and it doesn't sit very well at the moment so yeah <laughs> Is there a way to to keep sheep on purely on grass? I mean, I'm presuming yeah. answer is yes, but um, yeah. kind of, what advice have you got? Yeah, sheep are always problematic for many reasons. Cattle are usually the best in a pasture-fed sort of conservation system. Um, I don't feed any nuts or anything to our sheep. Um, we've got Cotswolds at you know 200 meters, not as you know, your, your climate was diff different to mine and soil type is different to mine, but it can be done. But I think that's about changing your genetics and maybe your breed slowly. It's taken me, I think it's taken us about 10 years to get to a grass fed Cotswold sheep system. We lamb in May when the grass is growing, no inputs required. So it can be done. Um, if you do need to feed, consider things like sandfoin nuts or grass nuts not soya based or um, grain based concentrates. 
And can I just ask a follow up question? Because the other part of it is, uh, do we want to be looking at trying to keep sheep from an ecology point of view? Is <laughs> do they graze in a way that's beneficial? Um, I'll let an ecologist answer that one, but I, I'm increasingly uh, wanted to get rid of my sheep for okay. similar reasons. That's where we're at. That's a conversation. Yeah. It's a live conversation yeah. for us right now. But yeah, you know, you, you, yeah. The, from a sward point of view, the cows are always the best. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks. Great, right, excellent question and great, great answers there. Um, thanks very much. Really practical one. You really, really interesting. Um, our next question is from Trevor Mansfield. Trevor, are you able to join us and ask your question? Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks, Mike. Thanks, John T. Um, really interesting talk, fully supportive of everything. I should say, I, I work for Natural England. Um, I just looked at those six principles and I, I may have misunderstood, but I just kind of uh, thought that there seemed to be ones missing in relation to valuing the you know, the natural environment, you know, the ecology side of agroecology, and also maybe the social elements. So I just wondered if we are missing a couple of principles at the core of regenerative agricultural mm -hmm. thinking. I think you, you're so right, Trevor. I, I think those five first principles are all agronomy, field-based principles, which are good, but potentially, you know, so at FarmEd, we talk about going further, enhancing biodiversity, improving connection, and we're trying to push that deeper regenerative thinking. Uh, but if you just take those five agronomy principles, it's only going to get us so far. So I think a bigger regenerative movement is needed. I don't know. Yeah, we could. Let's add some more principles, Trevor. Let's do that. <laughs> Good work with you on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Excellent. Wow. OK, so, yeah, no, very much. Uh uh yeah recognizing the the need for for more principles but also that wonderful sort of clarity of having those those sort of five regenerative um sort of you know principles is also re, you know good for good for us to um to focus on too um ian curtis ian can you actually you've got a question about um community financing are, are you able to speak i think you said you don't have a mic have so a mic. maybe i'd better speak so can you read that one john t it's um yeah um rewilding in scotland's trialing new community financing what are your thoughts about similar innovative community finance for regen food systems mm. um the whole green finance world is absolute wild west at the moment and it scares me as a simple farmer i don't know which way to turn yeah, every week i get approached either by a big investment bank or a small uh, you know or maybe more of a um, philanthropic investor um, with an idea about how to invest and can I plant trees on your land? Can I help you with transition? And I always ask, what do you want back? And what is what rate of return? Some are wanting more, you know, proper investment um, proposals. Some are doing it for free. And I wonder where the money's come from. So a bit of do 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 diligence needed. Can't say that today. So that community focus, I think, is going to be crucial going forward. Working together. Um, I'm not familiar with the model in Scotland or um, you know, community finance for regen, don't know. All I know is that as farmers, we need to work together and stick together a little bit, that solidarity, which is why the um, Cotswold, Northeast Cotswold Cluster Group came together and helped deal with some of these tricky issues because we don't know enough about the legalities and the risk, et cetera, with these big investors and transition funds. Um, so we are going to be hosting a conference at FarmEd in the autumn on oh. this subject because Ian's everyone's confused by it and, and worried. Ian's come back with community owned. Sorry, uh, missed miss my word, community owned with, community with a few owned. exclamations, if that helps. But I think you've, you have covered that. Yeah, your, community your owned sounds good. Absolutely. More community engagement, not a you know anonymous banker somewhere. OK, thanks. That one um, we've got. There are at least three more. If not, um, we're running out of time, but I'll, if our next questions can be reasonably brief, but keen to get through everyone. So I'll hand over to Nick Mottram. Nick, you've got a question there about teaching and our, our colleges. Yeah. Hi. Thanks, Mike. Uh, thanks very much, John T. Um, while I appreciate the farming community is, is very heavily 
um, bias towards older people. And there are still young people coming into the industry. And I was just wondering if you knew to what extent the agricultural colleges were teaching principles of regenerative agriculture. Mm, great question. Uh, having come from the RAU and land-based education, um, it's a bit frustrating, Nick, to be honest. Um, there are some really good examples out there of good modules, good, good lecturers um, doing some good work, but it needs to go a lot further. Um, but I often do question it because actually an 18 year old coming into farming land management kind of needs to learn the basics too. Um, and then slowly build in the complexities of regen and agroecology because it's quite deep thinking. Um, so it, you need to build it in and build it up slowly. Um, but no, it's not. In, it, there's lots more work to do. And we are actually working via FarmEd on a network of agroecological lecturers, bringing them together to share content and quality and leveling. leveling. Um, so we're hoping to meet in the summer and so we can all share modules and learning and really champion agroecology at university level. Great. Thanks. So, OK, uh, Nick, useful, useful comment. Yeah. Um, Ruth, you've got another question. So we're going to sort of rattle through the next two or three questions, I think, if we can. But Ruth, it's a big question. Um, and John, to you, very, very succinct and precise with your answers. So I'm, I'm sure you, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you'll be up for this Sorry. one. Ruth? It's really about the general discussion about, you know, we're losing CAP, but um, yeah. and Elms doesn't seem to be quite enough. What would you go for? OK, um, call it what we like. Well, yes, a payment for public goods, absolutely link it to what we do uh, but number one pay for the public goods we deliver already so that species rich grassland those hedges those wonderful woods we already manage and look after and then pay for transition and change after that you know, I, i've been farming with nature for 25 years and my payments are going down 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 with money going to, to the arable farmers to pay for change who haven't embraced this change for decades. And I'm thinking, do you know what? I should have ploughed it up years ago. I should, yeah. <laughs> I should have joined everybody else. It's getting harder for organic, agroecological, nature-friendly farmers to be rewarded because we have to pay for change. That's what the treasury wants to see, of course. Yeah, good point. Thanks. Um, a couple of questions left uh, we've got maria it's the follow-on question on the methane discussion maria are you there maria spink yes hi, hi. maria hi there thank you sorry yeah it might be too detailed john t but um i was wondering if you could explain a little bit more about the the biogenic methane and the difference between um primary fossil fuel methane oh and also about the GWP star, the new methodology too. Right. Um, at this point, I will refer you to Miles Allen and Oxford um, University research, which is really leading on GWP star. And it's just trying to give methane a slightly fairer um, leveling. Uh, all methane isn't equivalent and cyclical methane that hasn't been fossil fuel um, based and you know, be treated in a different way. Um, so there's lots of work being done on that now. Look at Miles Allen's work, Moxford University. Yeah, Google GWP star, and that'll explain it much better than I can now. <laughs> Brilliant. OK, and we've got one more question, which is from Paul Hill um, uh, about grazing cover crops. Paul, we do come forward and ask your question. Hopefully Paul's there. You able to unmute Paul? I think you can probably see Paul's question, John T. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Grazing of cover crops, when should they be done? Lots of debate. So a cover crop might go in the ground, let's say in August, September, grows lots of green stuff through the winter, locking onto carbon, locking onto nutrients and soil. Then you destroy it at some point and you can destroy it mechanically or with animals. Um, getting the timing right is crucial. We can do a lot of damage to our soils by trying to destroy it on a very wet day, putting too many animals on it, leaving them on too long. Every farm, every soil, every cover crop is different. Um, so what I don't want is strict prescriptions in elms to govern that. I think we need the knowledge and the outcome focus so we can graze our cover crops or destroy our cover crops at the right time. 
might be January, might be February, it might be March, might be April, uh, depending on weather, soil and growth. Great. <clears throat> Thanks. That's all the questions, which is about right, I think, in terms of our timings. So thanks to everybody for those really interesting and good, great variety of questions and some topics there which we could talk about for a lot longer, I'm sure. But do continue this discussion, um, at, you know, and, and be great to hear more. Uh, I was particularly fascinated to, to, about this rewilding to, to do or not to do and, you know, land sparing and land sharing. And a lot of clearly that's a big, big issue that's 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 apparent now in terms of the you know the use of land for food production or rewilding and nature so I'm glad you touched on that as well personally John T but I'll hand back to Camilla and uh, um, and to, to 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 thank you and to close the, the meeting um yes thanks Mike for um, managing the questions and for everyone who asked the questions as well that was a really interesting um discussion um and thank you very much John T it was brilliant that you could um come along today and give us that really interesting talk um it seems like, you know, regenerative farming can be quite complex, like much of, you know, nature conservation as well and ecology and things. Even working with nature is is quite complex. And the more I think any of us learn about any aspects of it, the more we realise we don't know and how complicated it is. But, you know, farm ed does show how things can be done. So it's great to have examples of, of how things can be done. Um, so um, I think I'll leave it um, there. So. Thank you everyone for coming along and um, as we said this will be available on YouTube um, so if anyone you know was unable to um, to be here live then let them know that they can um, watch it um, on YouTube at their leisure and um, yeah just um, good to see everyone and looking forward to working with you all um, over the coming year. Thanks everyone. Bye. <laughs> Thanks so much. Mm-hmm. <clears throat>